Well, this evening we are back in the same text that we were in this morning, so I'm going to read that for you again. Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. So would you listen carefully to this and let the Lord um, minister His truth to you even as, as I read this. this. It's been said that the Lord doesn't speak any more clearly, any more plainly, any more purely than when His Word is read, and that is certainly true. Luke 10, beginning in verse 25, and a lawyer stood up and put him to the test, saying, "'Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life?' And he said to him, "'What is written in the law? How does it read to you?' And he answered, "'You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul.'" and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. But wishing to justify himself, he said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied and said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among robbers, and they stripped him and beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. And by chance, a priest was going down on that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite also, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, who was on a journey, came upon him. And when he saw him, he felt compassion, and came to him, bandaged up his wounds, pouring oil and wine on them, and he put him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. On the next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him, and whatever more you spend when I return, I will repay you. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the robber's hands? And he said, the one who showed mercy toward him, Then Jesus said to him, go and do the same. Again, may the Lord bless his word uh, to us this evening to build us up into the image of Christ. Now, again, this morning we saw our Lord Jesus answer the question of what one, one must do to inherit eternal life. And, of course, when Jesus speaks... And particularly on this subject, uh, we had better listen to him and do what he tells us to do. Now, what did he say that we had to do? Well, he said, first of all, that we needed to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, our soul, our strength, and our mind, that we must love him with our whole being, that we must be fully devoted to him from the time that we're conceived to the time we die. But again, we saw that we, we know that we haven't done this. And we know that even today, by His grace, that we are unable to do this. So what are we to do? Well, Jesus says that we must trust Him because He is the one who did this. He says that if you will turn from your sins and trust in Him, He will give you His righteousness. Remember, that this is exactly what Jesus did. He loved His Father in this way. He loved his neighbor in this way, even though his neighbor may not necessarily have seen it as love. It is, and he did it perfectly. And if we will trust him, he will give us that obedience. And again, we noted that if we're trusting Jesus, if we are in him by faith, that when the Father looks at us, when he looks at our life, when he looks at basically our our bank account of righteousness, he won't see what we have done but he will see what his son has done and all of our works, which are all sinful, will be taken away. The only way that you and I can fulfill this qualification is by trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. But the other thing we saw that we need to make sure we don't forget is that when we do trust in Jesus, he gives us his spirit to work this nature in us, the ability to fulfill this command, the desire to do it so that we would begin to love Him in the same way that Jesus did. Again, the Spirit of God changes our hearts. He opens our eyes to see the beauty of God, to see His glory, so that we'll begin to move that direction. He 
opens our eyes to understand all that God has done for us in the Lord Jesus Christ, all that He has given to us in this world, and all of this is meant simply to draw our hearts to Him, that we may love Him in the way that He calls us to love Him. What we need to do, of course, is strengthen that love through those things He has given us to do it, such as the preaching of His Word, such as the reading of His Word, prayer and praise and fellowship, and to make sure that we stop doing the things that weaken His love in us by cutting off sin and the sinful influences that are in our lives. The more we use the means of grace, the more we obey the Lord, the more we cut off our sins, the more the Spirit of God will strengthen within us this nature and this love so that we will be able to do what the Lord calls us to do. Again, easy to say, difficult to do because we have our flesh, we have our old man fighting against us. Every time we seek to do what the Lord calls us to do, it's going to uh, rise up and oppose us. But if we do what the Lord calls us to do, His opposition will be weaker and that power of the Spirit, that new nature within us, the new man will be stronger. Well, we come this evening to the second greatest commandment, which is to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. And let's not forget that in doing this, we're also doing the first commandment, which is loving God who tells us that this is what we need to do. Now, we do need to understand that what was true of the first commandment is true of this one as well in two senses. First of all, Jesus has fulfilled this command. And if we turn from our sins and trust in Him, the righteousness that He gives to us includes doing this perfectly as well as loving the Father perfectly so that when the Father looks at you, He sees you as one who has loved his neighbor as he loves himself, as Jesus did. And again, the second sense in which this is the same as the first commandment is that even though Jesus fulfilled it, it is still the standard. It is still what the Lord calls us to do. The Spirit is working in us not only to fulfill the greatest commandment, but also to fulfill the second greatest commandment as well. So as we begin uh, this new year, uh, again, let's consider, secondly, that the Lord calls us in our loving Him with our whole being and devoting ourselves to Him that we love our neighbors as we love ourselves. Now, this evening, I'd like us to consider that under three questions. The first one is, who is my neighbor or who is, you know, who is your neighbor? The second one is, how much are you to love your neighbor? Are there any limits to this? And then thirdly, some practical ways that we can love our neighbors. So first of all, who is your neighbor? You know, that's the question that the lawyer asked uh, in, in this parable, or at least in this account, I mean. And the Lord answered him with this parable. Now, in this parable, did Jesus say, as we often understand this commandment, did he say that our love is to extend only as far as the members of the local church that we are in? We do know that, that Paul tells us that we are to do good to all men, and especially those who are the household of the faith. But I think we need to understand that it is broader than this. As a matter of fact, we have every reason to believe that when Jesus answered this question, he meant uh, that he really, well, he meant neighbor in the broadest sense, that we are to love not just those within the body of Christ, but we are to love our fellow man. Uh, neighbor basically refers to those who are near to us, but you know in, in this world in which we live, even those who are far away uh, have in some senses been brought near as we have the opportunity to do good to people who live in other countries. I believe the Lord is telling us that we are to love everyone, all of our fellow men. We are to love them whether they love us or not, whether they know us or not. Uh, we are to love them even if they hate us. It is interesting that Jesus, in His example, um, points out a situation where the one who helps the man in need is actually an enemy of that man. 
And he may very well have felt the same thing about the man in need on other occasions. Uh, we need to love even those who hate us. You know, there's actually a, several things about this parable that are interesting. One, first of all, we need to notice that when Jesus speaks of the man who is in need, the fact that he was left in the condition that he was half dead, that the first two individuals that actually happened upon this man were not just two Jews, but two of the type of Jews who had the particular office that would be most likely to help him. But they didn't. Both of them were Jewish. One was a priest and the other one was a Levite, which means that not only were they uh, fellow countrymen of this man, and we might say members of the same church, because remember the nation of Israel at that time was the church, but they both of them had a calling which would have obligated them beyond what the normal Jewish citizen might be obligated. I mean, what is it that a priest does after all except stand between God and man in order to reconcile them. He is the one that God has actually ordained as a servant to His people to minister to them. As a matter of fact, the Levites would be the second in line to do that very thing. They were the ones that helped the priests do the work they did in the temple on behalf of Israel. And they were the ones too that, that in many ways ministered like modern day deacons do, a ministry of mercy and even a ministry of, of teaching. So these are the ones that would be most likely to help those who are in need, but notice that neither of them served this man, neither of them helped him. They both decided that it would be better not to pay attention to this, not to see it, but simply pass by and leave it for somebody else to take care of. But who was the one who actually did help him? It was the Samaritan, and I think you've probably heard before the relationship that the Samaritans and the Jews uh, had with one another, and the fact that the Samaritans were um, not pure-blooded Jews, but rather they're half-blooded Jews. They were the result of the relocation of the nation, uh, the northern kingdom of Israel. Uh, some of them were allowed to stay in the land, others were, were dispersed throughout uh, the empire, and then others from the empire were brought uh, to live there, and they intermarried, and they produced this, this half-breed kind of culture. And yet, they had something of the true religion. Well, the Jews and the Samaritans both resented one another. They hated one another. And in this case, we see that it was one of these hated ones who stops to actually help the man, somebody he hated, and at the same time, somebody who, well, may have been tempted to hate him. Uh, on other, you know, in other circumstances. It wasn't a friend who stopped to help, but it was an enemy, and he stopped to help an enemy. It's interesting how the Lord draws out this parable. But in doing so, what he's illustrating is the very thing that he calls us to do quite plainly in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says, you have heard it, that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For He causes His Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Now, one thing we need to do is consider that the Lord is calling us to do something here that is perhaps the most difficult thing that He calls any of us to do, and that is to love our enemies. And why are we to do this? Well, it's because it's something that God does. God is good to all men. He's not good just to His people, but He sends His Son and reign even on the unrighteous. The Lord is good to all His creation. And He calls us to do the same thing that He does. He calls us to exhibit the same kind of nature to do good to those who also are our enemies. And to pray for them. So not just for our family, not just for the members of the church, not just for Christians in general, but even for unbelievers, even for those who know us and hate us and persecute us. So again, in answer to the question, who is my neighbor? Basically, everyone is my neighbor. And when we see that 
anyone, basically, someone in need, even if they are enemies of God, even if they are enemies of Christianity, even if they happen to be one of our personal enemies. The Lord is telling us that we need to reach out to them and try to meet their need if it is within our power to do so. Now, we're going to see in a moment, it's not for nothing that He calls us to do this. He does have a particular goal in mind, and you know what the power of love can do. So, who is my neighbor? Well, everyone is my neighbor, even my enemy is my neighbor, and I need to be willing to help them. Now, secondly, just how much are we to love our neighbors? How far do we need to go? Well, again, notice what the Lord says here. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. In other words, we need to love them as much as we love ourselves. Now, we've already seen that we need to love God more than anything else with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. But who comes second with regard to our love after God? Well, the Scripture tells us that we love ourselves, secondly. And that's why uh, the Lord, through the Apostle Paul, when He commands husbands to love their wives, He commands them to love them as they love themselves. The reason being, again, because we love ourselves. The Bible says, no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, which is why the Lord says, love them as you love yourself. Now, I think in, a, in, a, in the same sense, although perhaps in a more limited way, this is what the Lord Jesus is telling us that we need to use as our standard in our love to our neighbor we need to love them as ourselves. Now, I don't think that the Lord here is telling us that we need to love all men as we would love, of course, our wives or love our families or that we would do or should do everything we can to uh, raise, as it were, their standard of living or to take every consideration to fulfill their wishes and desires as we would do for ourselves or for our families because you know as well as I do that most of us struggle our whole lives to try to do that just for our family. It would be impossible for us to do that for everyone. And I don't think the Lord is intending to tell us here that we are supposed to help everyone that might feasibly ask us for help because you know there's a lot of people around today who aren't ashamed to ask for help when basically they're in the situation that they're in because they refuse to work and they know there are people who in order to sue their conscience will simply give them some of their money and they won't have to work. The Lord actually tells us that we are not to help people like these. Paul says in 2 Thessalonians 3.10, for even when we were with you, we used to give you this order. If anyone is not willing to work, then he is not to eat either. The Lord actually commands us to work and to eat our own bread. And the loving thing to do to somebody who would ask us for help in that situation would be not to enable them to continue to sin against the Lord by not doing the work they should be doing, but to encourage them to work by not helping them. Uh, Sometimes hunger is the best motivator to get people to work, and I think that's what's in mind here. And so there are certain things that the Lord is telling us that, that we're, we're not to do or we're not to go that far, but uh, we do need to understand just how far we are to go and what it is we are to do to help other people. And I think it's fairly clear from Scripture that what He would have us to do is to help those who actually stand in real need especially those that lack the things that are essential to their life or to their safety. We need to act to preserve and protect life, even as we would for ourselves, even as we would for those in our household, for those who are under our care. Now, again, in this parable, we see that this Jew was left in a condition which if he didn't receive help, I think the assumption is, he would have died. We already saw the fellow countrymen who should have helped him pass by. They weren't concerned, but the Samaritan was. 
and he saw him, and he felt compassion for him, and he came to him. He, he reached out to him in mercy, and he ministered the things to him that he needed that brought not only comfort, but also healing. He took him to an inn, and according to the parable, he cared for him as long as he could. But when he finally had to leave, he did make a provision to continue this man's care until he was well enough to care for himself. Now, I think what he did, again, was he loved this man the way that um, uh, he wished he would be loved and cared for if he were in the same situation. He loved him as he loved himself and within his means. doesn't say he went into debt doesn't say he went outside what he was able to do, but what he was able to do. He ministered that care to him that he would have desired for himself or for his wife. If she had been in that situation, he would desire somebody might minister to her as he would or to his son or his daughter if they had fallen in the same situation. And again, he did this even though the man he was ministering to was his enemy. Jesus says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, again, this is what the Lord wants us to do as well. When we see those who are in need, our hearts are to be moved with compassion and we are to reach out to them in mercy. Jesus says to us, as he said to the lawyer, go and do the same. And again, remember that even though Jesus has fulfilled the commandment, it doesn't mean that we're off the hook. We don't necessarily want to be off the hook. We should want to, by the grace of God in us, to reach out to others in love. So finally, let's consider some practical ways that we can love our neighbors as the Lord calls us to do. And again, we know that the, the, the final six commandments in the Ten Commandments are certainly geared toward that. And we're actually, uh, well... We will get back to them, but we were working through them to see how it is the Lord would have us to love our neighbor. But let's just back up a bit and do this more generally and think about some other aspects that we don't perhaps typically think about. So what can we do to love our neighbor? I think, first of all, I th we need to open our eyes and look for those who are in need uh, we need to realize that not everybody is in need in the sense, perhaps, that our Lord is, is telling us here. I mean, there, there are people, of course, everybody has particular needs, and we need to be aware of those, but they're not needs that we are always going to have to be meeting and, and be concerned about. Secondly, there are people who will ask for help who shouldn't receive it. We've already seen that. But there are people who really are in need who do need our help. And basically, they can be anywhere, right? They can be very close to us. They can be in our homes. They can be in our families, in our extended families. They can be in our church. They can be in our neighborhoods. They might be further away. Again, as we know, um, with communication the way that it is and being aware of things that are going on around this world and knowing there are organizations that are established actually to help people who are in real need and they're communicating those needs to us, there's going to be no shortage of people who are in need to help. And their needs might be different kinds of needs. They might stand in need of food and clothing and shelter, which again, many of these organizations that have been founded are seeking uh, to reach out and meet those particular needs. But they might have other kinds of needs as well, like the need of friendship, need to be encouraged. You know that when we lose loved ones and, and people are grieving, they, they need help, they need friends, they need someone to spend time with them. Uh, there are needs all around us, and everybody has some need. I mean, we all do. We just need to open our eyes and look to not be as, um, you know, the, the priests and the Levite who just passed by on the other side and just ignored it or pretended they didn't see it, but to see that need, to acknowledge that need, and then to do something, of course, to meet that need. 
One thing that often happens to us as human beings is that we, we have a lot of our own needs, don't we? And we tend to focus on our needs, and we, I think we tend to think that, that we have so many of them that we really can't do anything to help somebody else. We're looking for somebody uh, to help us. But sometimes the best way to deal with the needs that we have, I'm sure you've heard this before, is to focus on meeting the needs that somebody else has. The Lord actually tells us in His Word that when we reach out to help somebody who is in need, we are actually reaching out and helping the Lord and that the Lord will repay us because we are giving to Him. Solomon writes in Proverbs 19 verse 17, one who is gracious to a poor man lends to the Lord and He will repay him for his good deed. Now, certainly Solomon was addressing the, 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 well, the nation of Israel, the household of faith, the church in that day, and certainly it applies to the church. But let's not forget that the Lord tells us several places in the Old Testament that, that you must love your, you know, the alien as well as your countrymen and seek to help them as well. So I do believe this applies not just to those who are in the church, but also to those who are outside the church. We need to open our eyes and see the needs that are around us. And of course, secondly, we need to reach out and meet those needs and not expect somebody else to do it. That's another way we sort of let ourselves off the hook. And sadly, we end up imitating, I think, the priest and the Levite more than we do the Samaritan, passing by and again expecting somebody else to take care of the need. Well, the fact is, if we see a need, if we see a real need, and the Lord has given us the ability to, to help or to meet that need, then we should consider ourselves obligated to do that. We should help them and not leave it for somebody else to do. Now, again, sometimes, you know, we, we get busy. There's a lot of things. I mean, life is busy. We've got a lot of things to do, and sometimes we're in such a hurry we feel like we can't stop, we can't help, we can't take the time to do these things. But really, I think we'll find it would be the case that if we actually stopped to do what the Lord calls us to do in those circumstances and help the person who is in need, we'd find that we, we would get the things done that we really think we need to get done and we'll probably end up doing it better because we'll have God's blessing on what we're doing rather than, you know, turning a blind eye to this need and pressing forward and doing it and then having to struggle with our own conscience and ask the Lord for His mercy and forgiveness. If we put the Lord's concerns first, we'll find that the Lord will tend to put our concerns at a higher priority. Uh, we will get those things done. We will do them better. We will have God's blessing. That is the better way of going about it. So don't forget the well-being of your fellow man is more important or perhaps a higher priority than other things that we are going about doing during the day. Now, I, I do want to just also mention here that we need to exercise caution and wisdom if we happen to stop to help somebody who may be you know, somewhere and we don't know their character. Remember that if they, if they look dangerous, you know, don't feel like you need to stop and help them. If you see somebody broken down on the freeway, remember there are there are those services that uh, basically we have in our society. Most people have a cell phone. There are call boxes. There are highway patrols. You know, we, we don't necessarily have to feel like we have to stop and help people wherever they may be. We do need to exercise wisdom and caution and not necessarily expect that if we help somebody who looks dangerous and they turn out to be dangerous that the Lord's going to protect us in every circumstance. Um, well, we do need to be wise. Now, thirdly, we need to think about this. The needs around us are great. I mean, they are greater than we can possibly meet. Sometimes we might be tempted not to help somebody because the needs are more than we feel like we can actually take care of or actually meet. But let's think about it this way, that even though we might not be able to fully meet particular needs, there still is something we can do. And we should do what we are able to do. 
We shouldn't turn away from them, in other words, just because we, we don't believe that we can do all that they need. We can still do something to help them. And I believe the Lord would have us to do that when we're faced with a real need. Now, when you've done what you can, there's still more that you can do, which is pray. Help them as much as you're able to do and commit yourself to praying that the Lord would raise up the rest of the help that that person may need. Now, fourthly, let's remember why it is that God is calling us to do this in the first place. More than one reason, for sure. But ultimately, to do that person an even uh, better service, to do them even more good than just simply helping them physically. Remember, we saw this morning that the Lord calls us to be His hands and His feet, His eyes and His mouths, as it were, that in doing what we do, we are to do this for His glory, and we are to imitate the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, why does the Lord want us to do that? Why does He want us to imitate Him? Why does He want us to do good to all men? Well, I think two reasons. For one, for the same reason, I think the Lord does good to all men. Because in some sense, all men are His children. He has made all men in His image. In a certain sense, everyone everywhere is related to us in Adam. We're all, in a certain sense, children of God. And I think the Lord would have us to help His children. He wants us to help care for them. And as a matter of fact, that's what we do when we reach out to somebody that we don't know as a believer or, you know, who we may even know as an unbeliever. We're helping that person because they're in the image of God. We're not to take another life because they're in the image of God. doesn't matter whether they're a believer or not. The Lord wants us also to help them if they are in need because they are in His image and because they are His children. But I also believe, even more importantly, He wants us to do this because of the witness that we will bring to them of Him the way in which we will reflect His Son. Remember how Jesus said, by this all men will know that you are my disciples by your love for one another. And Paul says, you know, uh, do good to all men, especially to those who are the household of faith. Why are we to do that? Because in doing this, we're reflecting Jesus' character. We're becoming more like Him, but we are doing this with a goal in mind, the same goal Jesus had, which is that by His grace, perhaps we will bring them to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. Or if they're already trusting in Him, to uh, bring them to trust Him more, to encourage them, uh, to to really uh, do more for them than just meet their physical needs, but give them an example of faith and service that would encourage them perhaps to look up to the Lord to meet their particular needs. So there is a goal in mind here. And that goal is advancing the kingdom of heaven, bringing more people to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, fifthly, we're also encouraged by this parable, and this is the more difficult thing, not to let the fact that they might be your enemy stop you from helping them. Um, I, I do believe that the Lord would have us to be those who show mercy. Even as our Lord Jesus Christ showed mercy on the cross when He prayed for those who crucified them, uh, you know, Lord or Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. I mean, these are the ones that just hated Him and beat Him mercilessly and crucified Him, and He was praying for them. Sometimes in order to do this, we have to be willing to overlook the offenses that they have given to us. Uh, Uh, Give up the idea that perhaps uh, they might actually do what's right and ask for our forgiveness, even if they don't do that. We still need to love them anyway. You know, the Samaritan was willing to stop and help this Jew, even though the Jew didn't look up to him and say, look, I know I've been, been rotten to you. I know I've mistreated you. I know that my race has hated you, but please have mercy on me. Uh, No, the Jew didn't say anything like that, and the Samaritan yet felt compassion even upon someone who was a part of a group and who probably himself hated Samaritans. He didn't wait for the man to ask for his forgiveness, but he helped him anyway. 
And you may find that if you're willing to reach out and perform an act of kindness to an enemy, especially when that enemy is in need, that this might be all it takes to turn that enemy into a friend. Peter reminds us in 1 Peter 4, 8, above all, keep fervent in your love for one another because love covers a multitude of sins. And what he means by that is it allows you to overlook those offenses so that you're not so riled up in anger that you can't reach out to help somebody, but rather that love will overcome that and overlook that and reach out. And as I've said, that might be the most powerful way to influence that person to, to turn, to repent, and to seek forgiveness even. I think we'll do far more good than holding that offense against them and saying, I'm not going to help that person. They did this once to me. They can just struggle on their own. No, that's not what the Lord wants us to do. He wants us to love them as we love ourselves, even if they are our enemies. And then finally, I think what we find in here is that the Lord would have us not only to love them, but let's not forget the degree to which we are to love them as we would love ourselves. We need to love them enough. You know, not just do the minimum, as it were, but do what we can to relieve their suffering. Make sure we're not stingy. The Samaritan didn't abandon the Jew in the inn to become indebted to the innkeeper and have to work it off. He basically paid the innkeeper in advance and he made a promise to him that if his care should turn out to be more expensive than what he had left, that he would repay him on his return. Now, apparently, the Samaritan could afford to do this without jeopardizing his own well-being or his family's well-being. And if the Lord has blessed us with the ability to do that, then we should do that as well. Make sure that we love them sufficiently. Make sure that we take care of their need and not leave them, as it were, only half cared for and stranded but fully cared for, again, if the Lord gives us the ability to do that. So again, we, we have a rather tall order placed in front of us as we think about the things we looked at this morning and this evening. Actually, it's beyond what we are able to do in our own strength. We'd have no interest in it if it weren't for God's grace. But the Lord has given us His grace. He has fulfilled it in Jesus Christ. We have that righteousness in Jesus Christ, but we also have the spirit that he has given to us to work that grace within us. That is God's plan behind his work of redemption. That's why he sent his son into the world, not just to save people from hell, but to turn those people into obedient servants that would reflect his nature and character and be his witnesses in the world. Our purpose as Christians is to become like Jesus Christ, to love God as he loved God, and to love our neighbor as he loved his neighbor. May the Lord give us grace then as we begin another year and as we set our hearts to serve him to pursue these things because ultimately this is what is going to advance the kingdom of heaven. It's not just stocking our minds with knowledge and it's not just simply meeting together to worship, although that is part of our loving uh, the Father, loving God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, but we need to remember the other part of it, and that is reaching out to others, seeing the needs, meeting the needs, doing what we can to relieve suffering, doing what we can to help others uh, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ in the hopes that the Lord might actually draw them to Himself. May God give us the grace to be, again, His hands, His feet, to be His instruments, to be His servants, uh, to do this work in His name. Well, let's, um, let's bow in a moment of prayer and let's pray that God would help us to do that.